Hi, I'm Dan Crane. I'm a professor in the biology department at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. And in this video, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about how it is that statistical weights get attached to DNA profiles when the evidence sample constitutes a mixture. So unlike a single sourced sample where the random match probability is the statistic of choice, what do we do when we have a mixed DNA profile sample? A little bit more complicated of a situation. Like all of these videos, uh, the PowerPoint slides that I'll be using here for this video will be available at www.bioforensics.com, as well as many other additional reading materials that you might find helpful as you try to come to grips with some of these issues that I'll be talking with you about here shortly. All right, but with that said, let's get right to work and start talking about how it is that we deal with the problems that arise when a, an evidence sample constitutes a mixture, a very common scenario in forensic DNA profiling casework. So, this very first slide is simply a, you know, an outline of where it is that we're going to be going for the course of this, this video. Um, I've already said that uh, when we have a single source sample, we have a very useful, very robust statistic that can be used to attach a statistical weight. That statistic is known as the random match probability. And there's a video in this series that talks pretty much to the exclusion of anything else about how it is that the random match probability gets generated. But again, now we want to uh, ratchet up the complexity level here a little bit. And instead of talking about single source samples, talk about one of the things that can throw a monkey wrench into the works of attaching statistical weights to DNA profile evidence, and that is mixtures. You know, in subsequent videos, we'll be talking about other problems such as incomplete information and problems associated with relatives of individuals being possible contributors to an evidence sample. But for now, let's focus on the issue of a mixed DNA profile sample. And I think the way to set that up is by first making sure that we're all clear about what an unmixed DNA profile profile sample looks like. Uh, this particular image is showing us uh, a, a, a DNA profile that I've used in other of these videos before. It's simply the DNA profile that we see generated from an individual's reference sample. Right? So for a reference sample, there's usually no concern about a mixture. Right? It came from a single individual. If we see indications that the sample is a mixture, it's a pretty clear indication that some sort of problem has occurred, perhaps contamination uh, or some other issue. Regardless of the issue, we should just go back to that individual and get another reference sample from them so that we can see what their DNA profile is. But again, this is a clean cut DNA profile. Uh, easy to see where peaks are, and perhaps, uh, importantly, where peaks are not. But that, again, isn't what we want to focus on here. Now we want to talk about what happens and what you see when we're talking about a mixed DNA profile sample. And what this particular set of electropherograms is showing you is what happens when we de generate DNA profiles from reference samples and then mix the DNA that comes from those individuals uh, into a mock evidence sample. Uh, the top two electropherograms that you see, labeled contributor one and contributor two, are showing DNA profile information for three loci each, the D3 locus, the VWA locus, and the FGA locus. And you can see that at each of those three loci, both of these contributors have one or two alleles present. Again, that's the hallmark of a typical single source DNA profile. Uh, most individuals at any given locus will have at most two different alleles. If they have just one allele, it, what that means is that both their mother and their father gave them the same version of their DNA at that particular location within their genome. But if they have two alleles, as we see here for contributor one at the D3 locus, they have a 16 and a 17. What that means is that they are a heterozygote and that their mother gave them a 16 and their father gave them a 17, or vice versa, their mother gave them the 17 and their father gave them the 16. Bottom line, two different versions of the material. So again, at any locus, we typically will find two or one allele, two or one peak on these electropherograms. But for a mixture, that rule no longer applies. 
And when we combine the DNA from individual one and individual two, what we find is we give rise to a DNA profile then that has more than one or two peaks at each of the loci that we're looking at. You can see for the D3 locus, now three peaks have been labeled by the software that's giving us names to these peaks. There's a 14, a 16, and a 17 that are observed. And that shouldn't be too surprising because if you look back at what these two contributors had to contribute, you'll see that in fact contributor 1 has a 16 and a 17 that they can bring to this party, and that contributor 2 has a 14 and a 16 that they can contribute to the mix. And so what do we see? We see a 14, we see a 16, and we see a 17 in that two-person mixture. Similarly, at the VWA locus, there were two alleles in contributor 1, a 10 and a 7, I'm sorry, a 16 and a 17, and we see those both represented in the mixture. Contributor 2 had only one allele that they could bring to the mix, a 16. Again, we see the 16. What we see is a mixture of the DNA that came from those two people. And I'll leave it to you to do the same exercise looking at the FGA locus where there are two different alleles that are being contributed by each of these individuals to give us a total of four alleles in the final electropherogram for the mixture. So this, fairly unambiguously, fairly obviously I think, to a person who's trained in the ways of looking at these electropherograms, this is a mixture. Right, and we know that there's at least two individuals that have contributed to this mixture, and we can be confident that there are at least two individuals who have contributed because there are at least two loci, the D3 locus and the FGA locus, where more than two alleles have been observed. That is a hallmark of a mixed DNA profile sample. So, that's what a mixed sample looks like. Where's the problem, you might ask? Well, the problem is we need to now figure out how many people actually have contributed to a mixture. And we also need to figure what fraction of the relevant pool of alternative suspects might be excluded as a possible contributor to this particular mixture. Remember, when we're talking about evidence samples, you're usually just confronted with the mixture. And it's not the exercise that we've just gone through here where we've added the DNA of two individuals together. Instead, what you'll find is you'll find a sample where it's fairly apparent that that addition has taken place, but then teasing apart who those contributors are and who they may or may not have been, that starts to become challenging. And again, it's even challenging in some respect to figure out exactly how many contributors there have been to a mixture. Let me show you what I mean with this next slide. Um, it's about seven, eight years ago now that I and a number of others working here at Wright State performed a study where we looked to see how reliably it could be determined how many individuals had contributed to a mixed DNA profile sample. Remember from the previous slide or two, the hallmark for saying that a sample is a mixture is counting the number of alleles that are observed at each of the individual loci for which we have testing results. If you see a locus with three or more alleles, we are pretty confident that we're talking about a sample that came from more than one individual. Right? If you see a sample, if you see a locus with more than four alleles at a locus, that's a pretty good indication that we're talking about a mixture of three or more individuals. There's really not that much additional information that DNA analysts look to to determine the number of contributors to a mixture. That is certainly their first tool that they invoke when they're trying to decide how many contributors there are to a mixture, the maximum number of alleles observed at any of the tested loci. There is a little bit of additional information that can be gleaned from peak height information. Uh, a subsequent video will speak to that. But again, the go-to move, the, the main tool that's in the arsenal of a DNA analyst to determine the number of contributors to a mixture is the maximum number of alleles that were observed at any of the tested loci. And so, again, about eight years ago, myself and a number of other researchers here at Wright State did a study where we looked to see how often that type of approach, counting the alleles at the locus with the most peaks that were seen, how often might that type of approach 
give us an incorrect answer about the actual number of contributors to a mixture. And let me tell you what we did for this particular experiment. It's a pretty straightforward experimental design. We had available to us the complete DNA profile information for 959 individuals that the FBI had used for the purposes of determining allele frequencies. An important consideration when you're talking about generating statistics, random match probabilities, and so forth. But we're not going to use those individuals for that just here. What we wanted to do with these 959 individuals for whom we had complete DNA profile information, again, these are real people who have had their DNA profiles generated, we did conceptual mixtures of all of those 959 people. Let me emphasize the word there, conceptual. We didn't actually take their DNA and mix them together, but we knew what their DNA profiles were, and we combined them in a computer to say, gee, if we added this individual to that individual's DNA, what would we see in terms of the number of alleles at each of the loci that might be tested? How many alleles might we see there? And it turns out that with 959 individuals to do that type of conceptual mixing with, when you're starting to talk about three-person mixtures, again, these are instances where we know that we've combined the DNA profiles of three individuals, you can actually make almost 150 million different three-person mixtures, known three-person mixtures, through various combinations of those 959 individuals whose DNA profiles we had in hand. The question then was, what would we see in terms of the maximum number of alleles that we're seeing in those mixed DNA profiles at any of the loci for which we had information? In this instance, it would be 13 different loci that were being examined. And perhaps not too surprisingly, what we found is that for almost 50 million, about a third of these known three-person mixtures, <clears throat> excuse me, there was at least one locus where six alleles were detected. Let's take a step back, right? Let's simplify this a little bit here. That's not too surprising because we know that an individual can often contribute two alleles to a mixture. And if we have three people, each of them contributing two alleles, I don't think anybody should be too surprised that we might find some three-person mixtures where, in fact, we found at least one locus where there were six different alleles detected. That happened at at least one locus, one-third of these mixtures that we created. Perhaps a bit of a surprise comes from the fact that there was a bigger, fra a bigger fraction, almost two-thirds, of these three-person mixtures where there was not a locus where six alleles were detected, where the maximum number of alleles detected was actually just five. For instance, one individual contributed two alleles, another individual contributed another two alleles, and a third individual contributed just one allele, total of five different alleles. And we never saw at any of the tested loci more than five alleles. Two-thirds of these known three-person mixtures fell into that category, where the maximum number of alleles that were seen was five. But here's where this becomes interesting. I hope you'll agree, right? This is sort of a, a critical point here on this particular slide, because what we're seeing is that for almost five million of the 150 million three-person mixtures that we were able to make with these known individuals, for almost five million of them, there wasn't a single locus that told us that this was clearly a three-person mixture. Now again, remember, we know these are three-person mixtures, and yet there wasn't one locus of the 13 that were tested where we saw more than four alleles. Why is that an important threshold? Well, because again, when you see only four alleles, that's a clue, it's a cue, to a DNA analyst that what we're talking about here is a mixed sample, but a mixture of just two individuals as opposed to three individuals. The prevailing wisdom at the time of this study was that surely if you had looked at 
13 loci for a mixture of three people, you would find at least one locus where a fifth or a sixth allele was detected. And yet what we found was something fairly different. Almost 3.4% of the time, a known three-person mixture was presenting itself as if it was just a two-person mixture. Now I've had people working in DNA labs say to me when they hear about that particular observation, gee, I didn't think we were doing half so well at estimating the number of contributors to a mixture. That's pretty close, isn't it? You know, if we were assigning a, a letter grade to a student who had gotten a 96 or a 96.5% on an exam, that's an A. That may actually be an A+, plus, depending on what kind of curve is in play. But take a moment and think about what that actually means here. Remember the context that we're talking about. Sometimes it could be critically important to uh, a defendant to raise the alternative hypothesis that there was a third contributor to a particular sample. Maybe there was a crime that occurred and maybe the defendant really was there but they want to maintain that it wasn't them, it was some third person. If the crime laboratory is saying there's only two contributors, that might put that defendant in a difficult situation. And we see here that maybe three, three and a half percent of the time, there is an alternative that they would like to talk about that maybe this evidence is still consistent with the idea of a third contributor. But even another aspect of perspective on the, the context here is important to consider. Remember, when we're talking about DNA profiling results, that those results often have statistical weights attached to them that have words like quadrillion and quintillion and trillion and billion attached to them. In that sort of context, how acceptable is it to also work with a 3 or a 4 percent error rate? There seems to be an incongruity there when we're expressing that level of certainty about the chance of a coincidental match and then that level of uncertainty about a fairly basic element of the DNA profile, in other words, the number of contributors to that particular mixture. All right. So, that, I think, is an interesting observation and an interesting upshot from that particular experiment. And I should note that that experiment has been replicated by others using New Zealand's databases uh, and Australia's databases. This is a fairly robust uh, analysis. And it's true not just for what we're seeing in the United States, but probably worldwide. There's more, though. All right? Because it's also come to our attention that analysts would sometimes have discretion to disregard information at a particular locus. Their thought process seemed to go something like this. I've generated a DNA profile at 13 different loci. Right? There's a lot of information there. At 12 of the 13 loci, it seems as if the, everything is pointing to there being only two contributors. There's a pesky 13th locus, though, where I see a fifth allele, right? That seems incongruous with what had been observed at the other 12 loci. Maybe there's been some sort of error. Maybe there's an anomaly in this test result. Maybe there's just a tiny bit of contamination. These analysts, thinking along that path, often found that they had the discretion written into their protocols for interpreting DNA profiles to disregard information at a locus that they thought was incongruent or discordant with what they had observed at other loci. And what I'd like for you to do now is consider what sort of implications that might have to these incorrect characterizations of the number of contributors to mixtures. So the slide that we had looked at just a moment ago showed what happened if you did a straight up counting of the maximum number of alleles. But now let's look to see what happens when we're allowed to disregard the information at the single locus where the largest number of alleles were observed. Notice what happens to these numbers, right? Surely they have to move in this direction. They go from 48 million where the maximum number were six alleles to seven million. Right? That's, that just means that our experiment was probably working the way that we had anticipated that it would. <clears throat> Notice, though, what happens to these percentages. Right? Instead of seeing the maximum number of alleles at any of the loci be six, now that turns out to be a fairly rare occurrence. And we see many more instances, more than three quarters of the time, the maximum number of alleles observed is 76%. Again, almost three quarters. 
But again, that's fairly interesting. What I think is particularly interesting, though, is what happens after we cross this line. How often do these known three-person mixtures now, with this discretion that's been invoked, how often do they now look as if they may actually be a, a, a two-person mixture as opposed to a three-person mixture? Before when we weren't allowed to drop out information from a particular locus, that incorrect characterization of the sample would have happened 3.39% of the time. Now that incorrect characterization skyrockets. It's about five-fold greater at 18.28% of the time. I think this is very telling. This is a very important lesson to be learned by people who are working in DNA testing laboratories, by prosecutors, by defense attorneys, and maybe most importantly by jurors. It's very dangerous for an individual who's interpreting a DNA test result to disregard information associated with those test results. Right? That's a path fraught with peril. When I've explained this to analysts and shown these experimental results, quite often they've said, gee, I'm going to have to be much more careful before I decide that something is an anomalous finding or an anomalous result. They have no idea that disregarding that one bit of information might have been that one bit of information that was telling them the real story about a DNA profile. And so again, I think the bottom line here is, is that we're learning that sometimes that little bit of information that we're inclined to disregard is actually the thing that's telling us the real story. Well, let's move on. Um, one other way that we can start to analyze that data is not by looking just at three-person mixtures. As part of that study, we also did analyses with four-person mixtures. I'm going to cut to the chase here and tell you that when we're talking about a known four-person mixture, more often than not, known four-person mixtures were presenting themselves as if they were just three-person mixtures, right? If you add 61 to 15, it's about 76% of the time a known four-person mixture actually gave us no indication that it was a four-person mixture. Instead, it was appearing as if it was a three-person mixture. In other words, 76% of the time, we didn't see a single locus with a seventh or an eighth allele. Those, again, would have been the telltale sign that we were probably looking at a four-person mixture. We knew they were four-person mixtures, and yet the samples themselves would have been misleading to us. And just as before with the known three-person mixtures, this work has been confirmed and uh, validated with a wide variety of different databases by laboratories in very distant parts of the world. All right. So, where we're at is that I think we now have established that there are problems that come when we're talking about interpreting mixed DNA profile samples. Right out of the gate, what you might have thought would have been a very basic question, how many people have contributed to the mixture, that is a difficult question to answer. The answer that we often find labs presenting now in light of <coughs> what was found with the study that I've just alluded to is a testing laboratory will say that there were at least two contributors to a mixture or at least three contributors to a mixture. And they backed off of this tendency to say there were two contributors to the mixture. Again, the language that's typically used these days is that at least. I want to make sure that all of you watching this video appreciate that at least means at least. It doesn't mean most likely. It doesn't mean um, probably. It simply means there were at least two contributors. There may have been two. There may have been three. There may have been more. All that we can say based on counting alleles at loci that have been tested is a minimum number of the possible contributors without, again, attaching any more, any likelihood as to which of the actual number of contributors is most likely. All right, so counting the number of contributors, determining the number of contributors can be difficult. Determining what weight to attach to the profile is difficult as well. Let's talk about how it is that the statistics now get generated for a mixed DNA profile sample. Here's the thing. What I've got for you on this particular slide is the formal pronouncement of what the random match probability is, uh, is addressing. 
right? I've said in an earlier video that we need to be very careful about what questions these statistics are intending to address. The question that a random match probability is intending to address is very specifically, very explicitly this one. What's the chance that a randomly chosen unrelated individual, and let me emphasize individual here, from a given population would have the same DNA profile observed in a sample? Now that's not the relevant question because remember we're talking about mixtures. There's not an individual, there's multiple people who have contributed to the sample and we need to change our statistic. We need to formulate a new question and that's going to change the math is what it comes down to. So the statistic that most commonly gets used for a mixed sample in the United States is one that's known as a combined probability of inclusion. Sometimes laboratories prefer to talk about its reciprocal, which is the combined probability of exclusion. Those two values are really largely interchangeable. CPI is equal to 1 minus CPE. And you can do the math to flip that around if you like. Again, those two values are intimately interrelated. One is talking about what fraction of the population would be included. The other is talking about what fraction would be excluded. And it should be the sum of those two fractions should equal one. In other places, a different statistic is popular, not CPI or CPA, CPE. In Europe, the United Kingdom in particular, likelihood ratios are often invoked. I'm going to focus here in this video about how it is we calculate the CPI statistic. All right, so let's get to work. Now we've got a, a picture, an, an electropharogram that's showing us a mixed DNA profile sample. You don't need me to tell you it's a mixture, do you? You should be able to take a glance at this and say, oh yes, this is obviously a mixture. At the very first locus we're looking at, there are more than two alleles. In fact, there are six alleles that have been labeled. That is an, a prima facie uh, indication that what we're talking about here is a mixture of at least three individuals, because an individual should only be able to contribute two alleles at most. But let's focus our attention on one of these loci, We'll take a look at the VWA locus and talk about what it is we're seeing and what it is that we can do in terms of attaching a statistical weight to that one locus and then by inference talk about how we can do the same thing with all the other loci in this profile. So we've zoomed in now at this one locus. You can see there are four labeled alleles. There's a 14, a 16, and a 17, and an 18. The heights of those peaks are shown underneath those allele names. Again, this is clearly a mixture. We're getting an indication that there are at least two contributors just from looking at this particular locus. And let's talk about how we can attach a statistical weight. What fraction of the population might we exclude as a possible contributor? To do that again, we're going to invoke a statistic that's called the combined probability of inclusion. And here is what very formally the combined probability of inclusion is intended to address. It's going to deliver to us the chance that a randomly chosen, unrelated person could be included as a possible contributor to a mixed DNA profile. Okay? So what sort of things might, what kind of people might be included as a possible contributor? Well, check this out. We've got a sample that has four alleles, 14, 16, 17, and 18 at this particular locus. It turns out that there are 10 different genotypes, 10 different kinds of people that might have been able to have contributed to this mixture. I'll enumerate them all for you here, right? We could have an individual who's a 14-14, a homozygote for the 14 allele. Maybe they're one of the people who's added something to this mix. Similarly, <clears throat> we can't rule out the possibility that there's somebody who's a 14-16 who's added something to this mix. There's a 14, there's a 16. We can't rule out that there's a 16-17 individual who's contributed to the mix. There's the 16, there's the 17. Again, there are 10 different genotypes of people that we couldn't rule out as possible contributors. <clears throat> Let me pause here to draw your attention to the fact that if an individual was, say, for instance, a 2020, they would be excluded as a possible contributor. There is no 20 on that electropharogram. These are the genotypes of the people that would be 
included as a possible contributor. We're not talking here about individuals who would be excluded as possible contributors. <clears throat> For the purposes of this video, I think we can cut right to the chase and I'll tell you that there is a mathematical formula that captures this particular statistical question. All right? That mathematical formula, the CPI, works out this way. And the math here is actually very pretty, but it takes a couple minutes to go through. If you like, you can work it out on your own. But all we need to do to get the answer to our critical question here is this. We need to take the frequency of the 14 allele, P sub 14, right? How often in a relevant population do we see that 14 allele? And we're going to add that frequency to the frequency with which we see the 16 allele. And we'll add that to the frequency with which we see the 17 allele. And we'll add that to the frequency with which we see an 18 allele. And you take that sum, square it, and voila, you end up with the combined probability of inclusion. Okay? So the math has actually been worked out here for this particular example. At the VWA locus within Caucasians, the 14 allele occurs with a frequency of about 10%, the 16 allele with a frequency of about 20%, the 17 with a frequency of about 26%, and the frequency of the 18 about 22%. Add those four values together, square the sum, you can check the math if you like with a calculator, and you get that answer, 62.1%. What does that answer mean? I encourage you to stop and think about that for a moment. What that answer means is that's the chance that a randomly chosen, unrelated person could be similarly included as a possible contributor to this particular mixed sample at this locus. Think about that. 62% of the Caucasian population would be a possible contributor to this particular DNA profile. If that number seems kind of unimpressive to you, I, I think you're tracking well with what's going on here. That number is a lot less impressive than what you would have expected to get if you were generating a random match probability for a single sourced sample. And the reason it's much less impressive is because there's not just one possible explanation, there's many explanations. Here we have at least 10 different kinds of people who can contribute. When you start adding these many different alternative interpretations, they start to chip away at the weight that can be attached to this DNA profile evidence. But again, right, let's get back to work here. 62.1% is the value that we get for that particular locus. That's how, how much weight could be attached to failing to in, exclude somebody from that particular locus. And we can take that information back now to the context of the bigger profile, the, the larger set of electropharograms from which it has come. And we can put that 62.1% number there. And we can do the same calculation. I'll spare you the details and just show you the numbers. We can do the same calculation at all the other tested loci, invoke the product rule again, and multiply those all together, and get a CPI statistic that captures the weight for all of these tested loci, not just the VWA locus, but all of the 15 loci for which we have information for this particular sample. What's that CPI bottom line number for this sample, this mixed sample? one in 1.3 million. Remember, for a random match probability, it's really unusual to find a number that's not described in terms of quintillions and quadrillions. One in 1.3 million is a whole lot less weight than what might have been attached if this had been a single source sample, okay? But that's just the nature of the beast. When we're talking about mixture, because there are so many different alternative interpretations, that in turn, has an impact on the statistical weight that can be attached to the sample. So I feel now sort of like a biology professor. I want to give you a quiz of sorts as you're watching this video. Let's take a look at another electropharogram, okay? And let's think about it from the perspective of this being a mixture, okay? We'll focus our attention on a single locus, the FGA locus. And what do we see there? Well, we see that some computer software has told us that there are three alleles detected, a 21, a 22, and a 23. 
what do we want to do? Well, I think we probably want to, this is clearly a mixture, right? More than one individual. How do we attach a weight to a mixed sample? What we do is we talk about a combined probability of inclusion. Okay, and what's that statistic going to be addressing? It's telling us this is the chance that a randomly chosen unrelated person can be included as a possible contributor to a mixed profile. Here's our mixed profile. How many people, how many different genotypes could have contributed to this particular mixture? Well, where we have three alleles, there are a total of six different genotypes that might be in the mix. Here they are for you. We could have this be a mixture of a 21-21 with a 22-22 with a 21-23. That would account for all the alleles that we're seeing. These are the people. People with these genotypes are ones that could not be excluded as a possible contributor to this mixture. In other words, they could be included as a possible contributor to this mixture. So that's part of your quiz at this part of this video but I want to take this up just to one extra level of difficulty. I could ask you to do the math, right? But I'll provide that for you right here, right? The CPI statistic, what are we going to do? We're going to add the frequencies of the 21, 22, and 23 allele. We're going to square that. That's the fraction of people who would be similarly included to any one of these folks. But here's that next level of difficulty that I wanted to talk with you about. Let's just have you consider this for a moment. What would we say about a person who is a 2225? That's their genotype. What's the statistic that you would invoke to talk about a person whose genotype is 2225? And if you're looking at the rest of this slide here, and if you're looking at the formula, the answer should be fairly clear. Right? This is the answer because the CPI statistic isn't going to apply anymore. The CPI statistic is just telling us what's happening here for people who have a 21, a 22, or a 23. I'm now starting to talk about what about a person who has a 25. There is no 25 labeled over here. That probably means there's no 25 in the sample. If there's no 25 in the sample, what do we say about such a person? There's a word for it. We say that person is excluded. And if you remember from what you may have heard from my talking about uh, single source samples, there is no need to attach a statistical weight to an exclusion. Exclusions are absolute, right? There's no need to say they're pretty well excluded. They're just plain old excluded. Exclusions are absolute. So what do we do in a circumstance like this? where an individual has an allele that doesn't show up in an evidence sample. The CPI doesn't apply. It's certainly not going to help us get a statistical weight. It's not built up for that. There's no 25 in here in this formula. Instead, we simply should probably say that individual is excluded as a possible contributor and leave it at that. Okay? So, where are we? If we have a mixed sample, there are going to be some questions about the number of contributors to the sample, right? Happily, the CPI and CPE statistics don't need to know the number of contributors to a mixed sample. We'll get an answer with CPI and CPE that's independent of the number of contributors. Many argue that that is a significant advantage over the European alternative approach of likelihood ratios, where there needs to be an explicit hypothesis made about the number of contributors to a mixed sample. But we're not worried about likelihood ratios here. We're talking about combined probabilities of inclusion. When an individual has an allele that doesn't show up in the evidence sample, they're excluded. When they have alleles, that all show up in an evidence sample, they're included, and we can say what fraction of the population would be similarly included. But here's the thing. This is graduate level DNA statistics in some sense. What if we want to talk about some of the other phrases in play here for this particular statistic? You know, I said in an earlier video that we, every one of these words is fairly important. Let's talk about what if we're allowed to take some liberties with the underlined words in this particular slide. What if we're not so keen, so, so hardcore, about saying that the sample has to be a perfect match to a particular suspect? What if we're allowed a little bit of wiggle room? 
right? It sounds like a dangerous path. If it does, I think you are tracking pretty well with what it is that I've been talking with you about in these videos. But I want to bring your attention now to a particular case um, that arises out of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, you can tell from the dates on this certificate of analysis from a testing laboratory that the, some tests were performed uh, back in the middle of 2008. Uh, we don't need to get into a lot of the details about the particulars of this case, but four samples were tested by this testing laboratory. The key, the key one, the critical one, involved a handgun, a Rossi revolver, uh, and swabs were taken from it in, the, in an effort to determine who it is that might have been in possession of this particular weapon. The two possible individuals that might have had contact with the weapon were an individual named Franklin Xavier and his wife, Brendacia Xavier. The weapon was found under the driver's seat in Brendacia's car. The problem here is, is that Franklin, uh, if he was in possession of the firearm, would have been in violation of parole and a crime would have been, uh, would have been committed, uh, and that's the issue at hand, right? So tests were generated. DNA test results were taken from a swab of the revolver, and comparisons are going to be made to references from these two individuals. Here's what the lab found. This is called a table of alleles. Uh, this is a very common feature of DNA testing laboratory reports. And all that we're seeing here is an enumeration of what it is that the testing lab feels was present and in some sense absent at each of the tested loci. You can see a number of different loci are named along the way here. <clears throat> and for the revolver, we see which alleles the testing laboratory feels were observed in the electropherogram. At the D21 locus, a 28 and a 30. At the CSF1 locus, a 7 and 8, a 10, an 11, and a 12. And we can see the same DNA profile. This is the genotype for Franklin Xavier from his reference. And we have a standard, a reference profile from Brindacia Xavier. This is her DNA profile in this column here. Let's talk about what we see. Now that you're trained in the ways of DNA analysis, what do you see when you look at this particular evidence sample's DNA profile? I'll tell you, I hope the first thing that jumps out at you is that there are more than two alleles, right? That is a hallmark feature of a mixed sample. How many people have contributed to this mix? Well, let's see, there's, six, oh, there's five alleles that are seen at this locus, there are five alleles seen at this locus, there are five alleles seen at this locus. Five means more than three. Oh, I'm sorry, it means at least three. Let's, let me correct that. It means that we are looking here at at least three contributors. There may be four, there may be five or six, we can't say for sure. But this is unequivocally a mixed sample. When we're talking about attaching a statistical weight to a mixed sample, what do we trot out? What's the statistic that gets invoked? The statistic that gets invoked is a combined probability of inclusion. Okay, That's the norm, that's the universally, generally accepted statistic to bring to bear on a mixed DNA sample. So let's see what the testing laboratory concludes about this particular sample. Let's see if they agree with us when we say that it's a mixture. Oh, sure enough, this is from their report. Their conclusion is that the DNA from that particular item, the weapon, the revolver, was a mixture of at least three individuals. I think we're spot on in agreement with what it is that the testing laboratory had concluded. Franklin Xavier, his reference sample, can't be excluded as a possible contributor to this mixed DNA profile. That means we need to talk about a combined probability of inclusion, doesn't it? I'm not aware of any generally accepted alternative. It looks as if the laboratory has attached the statistical weight. That's the expectation, again, for any DNA profile match that the laboratory would attach a statistical weight. Uh, there's an abundance of case law in the United States that suggests that there is no other choice. And sure enough, they talk about a probability. They say that the chance that somebody would be similarly included as Franklin Xavier was 1 in 1,600. In other words, you might have to look at almost 2,000 people before you found somebody else who would be included the same way that Franklin Xavier was. They go on to say that his wife, Brendacia Xavier, also can't be excluded as a possible contributor to this mixed profile. And they go on to report a statistic. They say the chance that a randomly chosen unrelated individual 
would similarly be included is one in 600 individuals. Let's pause there for a moment. What do you think? Does this sound reasonable? Does that sound sort of what you would have expected to take place here? I'll tell you, there's something that's raising a red flag to me. There's something that I'm a little bit worried about when I see this particular couple of sentences in this report. And I'll draw your attention to it with this underlining. I don't understand, at least as I read this particular paragraph, how it is that the testing laboratory has generated two different statistical weights. The CPI statistic isn't dependent in any way upon the DNA profile of a suspect or the individual who's being compared. It's driven entirely by the evidence sample. And nobody here is suggesting that the evidence sample has changed. It's always this revolver that we're talking about. The only thing that's changed is the suspect or the person that we're comparing to. Franklin Xavier in one instance, his wife Brendacia in the other instance. That shouldn't be the reason that we see a change. Why are those two numbers different? Well, I'll tell you, when I first saw this particular report, it, it's, I, I gave the testing laboratory the benefit of the doubt, and I said there must be a typographical error, right? Maybe they meant to have typed in 1 in 1,600 individuals here, and because of a typo, it's only 600, or maybe it's really 1 in 600, and somehow or other an extra 1 and a comma ended up there, right? That's possible. But to answer that, you know, which of these two numbers is correct, I need to roll up my sleeves and get to work and calculate the CPI. So here's the DNA profile. These are the alleles that are seen. I think you appreciate now what we need to do. We need to determine the allele frequency for the 28 and the 30 in the relevant population, the frequency of the 9, the 10, and the 11 at the D7 locus in the population. Do the math crank out some numbers and see what, which of those two numbers, 1 in 600 or 1 in 1600, is the number that we come up with. But you may have also noticed that I've got a red underline over here. Do you recall, it wasn't too long ago in this video, I asked you to consider a mixture at the FGA locus where we saw a 21, a 22, and a 23? And I also asked you what we would do, what statistic we would apply if we had a suspect who was a 22-25. Those were the very numbers that we had talked about previously. I think that earlier I had you all agreeing that if we had somebody who was a 22-25, that CPI doesn't apply. This individual, plain old flat, simply is excluded as a possible contributor. And CPI is no longer relevant. Exclusions are absolute. So what has happened here? At the FGA locus, the evidence sample shows a 21, 22, and a 23, no 25. It seems to me there's another problem with the statistic that the lab has reported. Xavier shouldn't have a statistic. Exclusions are absolute. And if you're jumping ahead of me in this video, you may have already noticed that Brendacia, his wife, is excluded as well. She's missing two alleles. Well, she has two alleles that are missing from the revolver at this locus and another allele that's missing from the revolver at this locus. I would say we don't need to do a CPI at all, right? We can save ourselves a lot of work here by simply saying both of these individuals are excluded as possible contributors. You know what the testing laboratory did in this particular case? It's not that uncommon a practice. What they did is they said, we can't exclude Franklin at any of these tested loci except this one. Remember before I said sometimes laboratories invoke their discretion to disregard information at a locus? They chose to disregard the information at this locus because they feel that they may not have gotten a complete look when it came to saying if Franklin was included or not. They chose to disregard this locus and this locus when it came to addressing Brendacia, but curiously included this locus for her CPI calculation. And they included this locus and this locus for Franklin's CPI calculation. You know what we're talking about here? This is a totally suspect-centric approach. And what's happened is the testing laboratory has deliberately chosen to ignore loci with information where they said there was a, quote, missing allele. 
The laboratories that do this often claim that what they're doing is a conservative approach. They're, they would tell you that we could have made the statistic even more damning if we had included the frequencies of the alleles at the loci where the suspect was excluded. I don't quite see the logic there, but that is something that I've heard argued a number of times. And I think the key here is it's ignoring what Franklin Xavier in this case wants to be the only thing that people talk about. He's excluded. That locus where his allele was missing is the only thing he wants the jurors and the judge to hear about in his trial. That's pointing to the fact that he did not have contact with that weapon. Maybe three or four other people did, but he was not in the group because his 25 allele at the FGA locus was not there. All right. I tell you what, I'm not the only one who thinks this way, that there are problems with this type of approach, which is disturbingly commonly encountered in crime laboratories within the United States. I'm not alone in thinking that. The International Commission or International Society on Forensic Genetics uh, has written a paper that espouses essentially the same concerns that I've been trying to draw your attention to here. You can get a citation to that paper as part of this slide, and the paper, of course, is also available at the bioforensics.com website. But I think they put it well that that type of approach, ignoring that type of locus, uh, is failing to acknowledge that choosing the admitted loci is suspect-centric and therefore prejudicial against the suspect. Now again, I think that's exactly what's happened with Franklin Xavier in this particular instance. So, where are we? We're at a situation then where if you have a mixed sample and it's clear that all the information is present, we can help with that. We can attach a statistical weight. That statistical weight is called the combined probability of inclusion. But if we find ourselves in a circumstance where there are questions about how complete the information is for our DNA test results, maybe there's been this phenomenon known as dropout, maybe we're missing an allele or two from a locus, we find ourselves in a very difficult situation. Um, in a nutshell, determining the rate at which dropout occurs is very difficult. It's hard to determine based on an evidence sample, and you simply can't look at the suspect's profile to say that that's why the evidence sample doesn't, uh, that dropout has occurred. Uh, that's a very short logical fallacy, um, and again, it's a suspect-centric approach at the very least. It's not giving the benefit of the doubt to the defendant. And that, again, is something that our criminal justice system uh, is very strongly against, this idea that we want to give the defendant the benefit of the doubt as opposed to interpreting the evidence in ways that are most incriminating to them. That is something that our criminal justice system frowns upon. So what are we to do? This is a fairly pr large problem. Attaching a rate to dropout is something that nobody can agree to at the present time. And we don't want to take away the defendant's right to be given a, the benefit of the doubt. But I tell you what, I think I might have a solution to this problem. All right? And I think the solution might come from turning things on their head. Instead of trying to avoid allelic dropout, invoking allelic dropout, Let's do this. Let's be crazy for a moment and invoke allelic dropout as an explanation for any old problem that we find when we're trying to include or exclude an individual as a contributor to a mixture. That's not the approach one would normally take. We're usually trying to minimize dropout, but here we're going to embrace it. And also, instead of going out of our way to give a defendant the benefit of the doubt, let's do this. Let's just build as strong a case as we possibly can against them. Right? You may be thinking this is going to lead us to a problem, right? There's issues involved with both of these. But look what happens when we play this out. How about if we start talking about a, a potential solution to this problem of a mixed sample with dropout? And I'll give it a name. Let's call it the combined probability of partial inclusion. I'm going to slip in one extra P. And all that I want to do is do that same game that had been done with Franklin Xavier. Invoke dropout at the locus where his allele is present in his reference but not present in the evidence sample. I want to do that same game, build as strong a case against an individual as possible by invoking dropout whenever I need to. 
but I don't want to do it just for the suspect, right? What's good for the goose should be good for the gander, right? What we should do is this. Why don't we do that same game, not just for the suspect, but for one million individuals that we know had nothing to do with this particular crime, with this handling of the weapon in Franklin Xavier's case? Right? Where are we going to get those million people that we know didn't have anything to do with the crime? That's easy. We can generate random DNA profiles based on our knowledge of allele frequencies. Right? These are artificial people. They don't exist. They couldn't have had anything to do with the crime, and yet they're reflective of the kind of people we might find out in the real world with their DNA profiles. And let's again do that same trick. Whenever we're comparing one of these million random men to the evidence sample, whenever we need to invoke dropout, let's do it. Let's just base a CPI calculation on those handful of loci where the suspect can't be excluded. And then compare those CPI values to the one that we got for the suspect. How often might we find that we would get a random person who had nothing to do with a crime with a more damning partial CPI statistic than the suspect? For the Xavier Franklin case, or the Franklin Xavier case, the answer is really quite striking. It turns out that quite a large fraction of those million people who we know had nothing to do with the crime have DNA profiles that we could have made a better case against him, a better case against them with. Their suspect-centric CPIs are more damning than Franklin Xavier's was, and yet we know they didn't have anything to do with that weapon because they don't exist. I think what we might have here with this combined probability of partial inclusion is a way to get around this tendency for laboratories to want to disregard information at loci by invoking this phenomenon of allelic dropout, right? Maybe we have a solution for attaching a statistical weight to a mixed sample where dropout may have occurred, right? But that, again, is pretty high-level um, DNA profiling statistics. Let's get back to the, the core principles here and wrap up this particular video. You know, I think it's fair to say everybody would agree that the weight for a mixed DNA profile sample is going to be less impressive than if you were talking about a single source sample. I'll tell you it's for that reason that many testing laboratories endeavor to tease apart a mixture into a major and a minor contributor so that at the very least they can generate a random match probability for the major contributor right? because the, the CPI statistics are always less impressive. I've talked with you here about how it is that it can be difficult to even determine the number of contributors to a mixture, and I think all DNA profiling experts agree, uh, at least within the United States, that the CPI statistic can give us a useful weight to a mixed sample if we don't have to worry about the possibility of dropout. Right? So there is a statistical weight. It may not be as impressive a statistical weight as what we get for a random match probability, a single source sample, but there is still a weight that can be attached. And I think that brings us to the end. Right? Um, this has been a video that I've intended to have explain what's going on with attaching statistical weights to mixed DNA profile samples. Uh, if you would like to see these slides or get more information about this particular topic, you'll be able to find both at www.bioforensics.com.